Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and welcome back to another Carbon-13 NMR video. This is the only other one that I'm going to do, and it's just about the chemical shifts of Carbon-13 NMR. Right in that previous video, I kind of compared and contrast proton NMR with carbon-13 NMR and talked about the, how the number of signals correlates with the number of uh, carbon environments. So this one, we're going to take a look at these chemical shifts. Now, the terminology is the same, right? We're going to have the same sort of terminology where as you move left, that's still downfield. That's still where you find things that are deshielded. As you move to the right, that's still upfield. And that's still where you find the more shielded, shielded nuclei. So just like with proton NMR, you'd expect something near an electronegative atom, for example, to be shifted downfield, or in other words, move left, compared to a carbon that is not attached to something electronegative. It would be more upfield. Um, it would be more shielded. So same general concept. I'm not going to re-explain that concept. If you want review of the idea of shielding, you could go, should go back and look at the proton NMR uh, video on the chemical shifts. So let's take a look at some uh, chemical shifts. Again, <clears throat> like with carbon-13 NMR, right, you can find tables and tables of data showing you where everything kind of shows up, and it can get real specific and real granular. Uh, by all means, take a look at those. If you're great at memorizing thing, things, uh, memorizing them is certainly not going to hurt you. But again, what I want to do for you, which is the same thing I did for IR and proton NMR, is give you kind of like a really bare bones, very digested, rough idea of where to find stuff, right? So this that I'm showing you right here, that works great. Go for it. But let's look at sort of a simplified version. Now, again, remember that uh, carbon-13 really kind of goes up into the 200, so it's not like it only goes to 12 or 13 like protons. So here I have it chunked out into 0, 50, 100, 150, 200. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide this up into what we typically see in there. And more or less, again, this is a little more hand wavy than the um, proton stuff is, but more or less, the first chunk of 50 is where you tend to find most of the just alkane-like carbons, right? So things that you'd find in like a butane or maybe a cyclohexane with some carbons on it or, you know, just plain uninteresting stuff. No double bonds, no electronegative atoms, stuff like that, right? Just plain alkane-like stuff. So that's where you'd find uh, carbons like this and this and this. You'd expect those to be somewhere between 0 and 50 ppm, something like that. Same thing with this friend out here. Now, you know, while I'm pointing at this one, while this would show up somewhere between 0 and 50-ish, probably more on the downfield side of that, right? Because it's next to a carbonyl. But it's not like being next to a carbonyl is going to shift it like crazy far downfield for carbon. But it might be a little bit more. So maybe around 50-ish is where I expect to see that, for example. Now let's look at the next region. Again, we're going to go with just big old chunks of 50 here. This next region is where you tend to find the carbons that are attached to those more electronegative elements, generally speaking. Iodine is a weird example. We're not going to get there. But generally speaking, this is where you tend to find those sorts of things, somewhere between zero, or sorry, somewhere between 50 and 100. So that'd be like this friend right here. I'd expect to find that somewhere in this sort of range. Now, the next chunk is going to be basically all your stuff with double bonds, right? So we're talking about CC double bonds. We're talking your aromatic regions, stuff like that. So carbon-carbon double bonds primarily, right? Those are the most common functional group that you're going to see, um, you know, versus like C double bond ends, for example. So you expect to find those somewhere between 0 and 150. So that'd be like all of these friends. Sorry, not 0 and 150, 100 and 150. And that would be like these also, right? So alkenes, aromatic rings, stuff like that generally tend to show up here. And then lastly, this group going up to 200, uh, 220 or so, right? Just basically beyond this, that tends to be your carbonyls, whether they're aldehydes or esters or ketones or amides. They're all going to be in there. And then depending on you know, how much electron density that they have, they might be a little more upfield or downfield within that region. But generally speaking, above 150, you know, all the way up to like 220 or so, tend to be carbonyl. So that would be like this friend, right? So this carbon right here, let me just circle just that carbon. So this carbon right here, right, this environment should show up somewhere between 150 to 200 ppm. And that's how we're that's how we're going to use this, right? Big chunks, big chunks of 50. Again, that's just alkane-like stuff, stuff attached to something electronegative, things with alkenes, 
and then carbonyls. Now, again, you notice I didn't put alkynes on here, right? They kind of show up in this middle region. I mentioned CN double bonds can kind of be over here. So there are some things that are not shown here, but again, this is just to give you a tool so that you can uh, internalize this. And when you look at carbon 13 NMR, you can have a good job. You'll have a, you'll do a good job of interpreting them. So like, let's look at these molecules, right? Again, just to kind of predict where we might see signals. Um, I see one, two, three environments here. I see three environments. Um, this red one, it looks just alkane-like, so I'd expect somewhere between 0 and 50. The blue one is also alkane-like, so it's somewhere between 0 and 50, maybe on the higher end because it's getting close to that carbonyl. And then this one's on the carbonyl, so I'd expect somewhere between 100 and 200 ppm. All right, this example is a, a ketone versus, or this is an, an aldehyde versus my other example is a ketone, but still, we're just looking at the carbonyl, the C double bond O. So those, that's where I'd expect to find those sorts of things. If I went over to the other one on the right-hand side, right, I've got that carbon, this carbon, and yet another, yet another, and yet another, right? So I have five in this case. Um, again, for the alkene ones, that should be somewhere between 100 and 150, somewhere in there. I'd expect the same for the other alkene one, no reason why that would be any different somewhere in that region, but two different signals, two unique signals. Um, this now is just plain an alkane-like, so somewhere between 0 and 50. Purple one is also alkane-like, so somewhere between 0 and 50. And then lastly, this one in black next to the chlorine, I'm expecting that sucker to be further downfield, somewhere between 50 and 100. Maybe near, closer to 50 probably. So somewhere in that region, right? So I should be able to have some rough ideas of where I might find things. I'll take a moment to say, just like with proton NMR, if you have multiple of these factors, like say you're um, in a double bond and you're next to like an oxygen or something like that, you'd expect those to add up and shift you even more downfield and like out of the ranges that I'm giving you here. So kind of keep that in mind as you're looking at spectra. These um, de-shielding effects can stack on each other and start moving signals much more downfield than you'd expect. Now, if you remember, we had this slide at the end of the other video. I had four molecules. I said, well, we've got all these different um, uh, peaks here. So I had one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And we said that these couldn't be it because they didn't have seven signals, right? If you don't remember that, you can go back to that video. Just take a moment, pause, and convince yourself that those two do not have seven, um, those do not have seven different environments. Now, if I look at my carbon-13 NMR here, right, I can see, I can start to analyze this, right? I've got some stuff between 0 and 50, right? So here's that first region, that 0, 50 region, the one that's just alkane-like. So I'm expecting two different carbons to be alkane-like, right? If I look at my next region over between 100 and 50, this is where we said we had carbon attached to something electronegative. And I don't have anything like that. So I'm not expecting any of my carbons to have something attached to, to be um, attached to something electronegative only, right? So like in this case, I do have a chlorine here, but it's also attached to a double bond. And I do have a chlorine here, and I do have an oxygen here. So actually already I'm kind of not liking this one on the right because I'd expect this carbon to show up in that red region I just showed. And I would expect this one to show up in that red region also because I have a chlorine attached to that carbon and an oxygen in there. So I'm already grumpy about this one. I don't, I don't think that's it, but let's take a closer look. If I continue down, right, this next region, so about 100 to 150 or so, we said that was the things that had CC double bonds in them. And already, boom, right, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this one right here, right? That's got a whole bunch of CC double bonds in it. In fact, it's got four different types of CC double bonds, right? It's got that carbon, these two are the same, those two are the same, and that one's the same, and that's one, two, three, four signals. And in fact, I should get four signals. So I'm, all, I'm really liking this one already. The, one, the other one that we were looking at before that I said I didn't like because it's got stuff attached to an uh, electronegative element, I don't even see any alkenes in here. I see no double bonds, so I do not like that one. I don't think this is it. I think I've already found the winner. That's the second one. But let's just put this last piece of information together, which is that I've got something above 150. We said that that was carbonyls, C double bond O's. And sure enough, we have a C double bond O in this one. So this must be my winner. This is my molecule, check. And this cannot. And again, that's based on the number of shifts and the what I'm seeing, sorry, the number of environments, the number of peaks, and then what I'm seeing in the chemical shifts.
So this is just an example of how you can use the carbon-13 NMR to help give you more information about what might be going on. Now, could I have figured out this, this structure from just this NMR? Absolutely not. Not nearly enough information in this um, spectrum for me to deduce that it was this aromatic compound with the ketone and the chlorine. Absolutely not. But if I have a guess as to what I think I made, like say I made something in the lab, I could use this to confirm it. I could also use this information with proton NMR, with IR, with mass, mass spec, and then I can start getting a much bigger picture, a much better picture of what my molecule should be. So you sh after these watching these two videos, you should be able to use carbon-13 to help support this, um, what you're proposing as a structure and also for you to look at a structure and make some guesses about what that spectrum probably is going to look like. So uh, study up, do lots of practice, good luck.